it occurred to me yesterday after I'd done my video and I'd mentioned about the moon landing and I thought well you know when I was a kid <laughs> no one had the access especially not me at four and a half years of age to know any different than what was on the TV but you know as you go through life and you encounter things like at the same time um, there was in the newspaper all the time about uh, JFK's assassination too. The front page of the newspaper which used to get delivered every day would have different pictures of the JFK assassination. And I'm bringing this up because um, that brings to question another thing. There's, there are a lot of people my age remember the JFK assassination a lot differently to what the picture shows on the internet now. How many people were in the car? I can tell you that when I was a kid there was two people in the front and two people in the back. That was plastered across newspapers everywhere. It was one of those things that went on for years years they published these photographs in the paper and daily exposed to them it becomes entrenched in your mind much like if they repeat the same ad over and over again even though you hated the ad suddenly you could recite it word for word because it's entrenched in your memory the same thing about the JFK assassination and also um, here in Australia with the um, Whitlam sacking that went on for quite a few years too. So what you remember, even when you're a child, comes from a lot of the headlines in the newspaper. You know, Mum used to get the paper delivered every day and JFK was the hot topic for years to talk about. So even back then, you know, what went on with how he was killed and everything, I mean, we're only just starting to uncover the truth. I mean, certainly back then, and even as a young adult, I didn't even have access to the speech that JFK did shortly before he got killed that, well, was probably the reason why he got killed. And it was an inside job. He was assassinated. The Bushes were involved with it. Yes, it all goes back to the connections with um, all these different, look, you could call them Illuminati, but they've got so many different names and caps and organisational arms and sex and things that they work through, but they all come back to the same power structure, the same mindset, all working together. It's it's a nasty, nasty mess out there in the world. And it's not something that has been going on for, you know, only a couple of years or a couple of decades. This is generational. This is ambition and power structure that is passed down through the generations. And the people that are ruling over us claim right because, um, well, they can claim somewhere on a piece of paper that they're related to somebody that's related to somebody else that ended up being, oh look we're related to Jesus uh, and we've got all the right because we are, um, you know, we've taken over from the pharaohs who were the god kings, you know, we now represent God on earth and we have the lineage right. This is a kind of mind concept. Now if it was godly or goodly that they had um, ambitions for or that they were even practicing this world would be heaven on earth we wouldn't even be talking about them but in they're the exact opposite now the reason I'm telling you all this today is because when I look at information I want to know who's what kind of a person is telling me that and I um, like this guy Morgan that I've talked about in previous videos I like to go really digging and not to just look on the surface but to find out you know more about this person especially when you know my I don't set out 
to distrust what people say. It's because of what they say that I end up something just doesn't sit right. You know, they might say something and I think, well, that doesn't make sense. That's a bit stupid. Or, um, you know, we all have that when we're listening to somebody is that, you know, they can be rabbiting on and saying whatever and you're la 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 and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, all sounds good. And then all of a sudden they'll just say something that just doesn't fit. It's, it's not right. It it's, doesn't seem like it should be there. And it sticks out. Well, it does for me anyway. So I thought, well, I'm going to tell you what kind of a, th a person I am, what, what I've looked at, what I've discovered in life. You know, the things that, like, um, I've looked at a, a lot of people, and this is where I've said about seemingly intelligent people believe in flat earth. <laughs> All right, I did look into it. I mean, like anything that is put out there, you have to look into it to know whether what they're saying has any foundation to it. So, you know, any bullshit that has come up in the last, well, in the years of my life, I've looked into it to find out, well, is it true or not? And in fact, the, the image on the screen right now is largely because I had an instinct that, look, I'm hearing all this stuff about what's supposed to be out there in space and all these lens effects and everything and I don't really know so I'm going to go and find out for myself. And I did two years of studying light, the, the sky um, at night. I have photographed stars. This is actually Jupiter with three of its moons and you can see other stars in the background. And I could tell you exactly what those stars are if I wanted to because of the, the date on the photograph. I bring up my Stellarium program put in that date and it'll tell me where Jupiter was at that precise time and I can pinpoint all those exact stars that you can actually see surrounding it. So I didn't want to take NASA's word for it or all these other people that are saying oh Nibiru is coming in and Planet X and all of this because um, this goes back to something that in my childhood that I didn't mention in my previous video was um, through my life there have been certain times when I've had certain recurring dreams and one of the recurring dreams I had when I was a kid was quite horrible and um, that's one of those things that's etched in my mind too all the images of it essentially the um, earth is is burning it's burning but it's it's not with flames it, it's it's weird um, it's it, there's an orange glow a really big orange glow and it, it's the same dream I used to have over and over and over again the whole world is getting destroyed and people are running and screaming and I'm with um, the animals, the animals are running with me and there was um, a bear and a giraffe and a lion they were talking to me <laughs> I wished I'd you know written it down years ago so I could remember what they had said but there were only a few things that have stuck in my mind that I can actually remember there were more animals that talked to me too but I can't remember them I can only remember those three and the very distinct things that they said to me as you see, at that time, um, Dad wasn't in my dream. Uh, everybody is f fleeing the earth trying to find safety. And the animals are running with me and saying, come on, we've got to go. And I said, no, I can't leave my family. And when my, I was talking about my family, I was talking about my mother and my brother and sister. I mean, Dad didn't even ever come into the dream. And the thing was, he was still living at home when that happened. Don't know why that is. You know, that's always puzzled me. But anyway, so I'm running with the animals. The earth is burning and um, it's destroyed. It is, you know, it is an extinction level event that's happening. And it's going on all over the world. 
I know this even though I can't see it I know this so I'm saying that I can't leave to the the lion um, that I can't leave my family and they said well you know you have to you have to leave now and I said I, you know I can't leave them but the thing was that this dream about a catastrophic event in the earth I always thought was kind of like a premonition because I didn't understand it in context as a kid why I was even having it but through the different events that I've had through my life I know not only am I having can I have dreams of things that may have happen or even day um, well, I couldn't say they're dreams just something hits you it's like um, a knowledge that just hits you and you know something's going to happen and sure enough it does so the dreams the dreams about this when I had them when I was a kid I couldn't put into context but I always feared it there was this um, something's going to happen I always knew it there are uh, lots of other things that I had instinctually that I knew that where we are in 2020 was an event that was always going to happen you need a catalyst to break down the system so that a new one can be built and whilst there is an agenda going on that wants to build it their way it's always been planned that humanity will build it their way this is the battle that pulls down the structure removes what we don't want and builds the new yes it's going to be a shit fight but um, anyway I'll get back to this um, dream because I always thought it was a future event until other things came into play through the progression of life and experiences I realized that it wasn't a premonition of an event to come but more like a memory a replay of a memory that the catastrophe that hit earth at the time when human beings were on it was a time in a past life that basically we are cycling round to that point right now where we are in that part of space where that occurred it cannot occur again because what happened what destroyed I mean if you've got a rock and you break up that rock it's crumbs it's gone when you come around again that rocks not there you can't can't hit it again so essentially people are out there looking for something that uh, it does exist all right but it doesn't exist in the way that everyone says Nibiru and Planet X does and really that's a really deep out there concept that I would get into that I'm not going to get into here because I wanted to try and give people an understanding of where my head is at on things so that if if I say something what do you think about what I say how do you feel about what I say do you want to listen to what I've got to say because you know I've said particular things that you don't agree with and you don't you like as I said seemingly intelligent people as soon as they tell me they're a flat earther I'm not going to listen because if you can be at that level where you have so little understanding of the scientific world and how everything works I'm not even going to waste my time sifting through the bullshit because there is so much more I mean I have listened to their argument and you've really only got to watch one video because they're all the same they all repeat the same argument that just leaves you up in this mind fuck that says what the fuck none of it makes sense and yet they go well look I did this I could see so far and that proves the earth is flat again scientific method everybody needs to look at scientific method how people will go about to prove anything first of all what are the criteria of 
the, the the test. What do you intend to achieve with it? And are you limiting your test by the parameters of your test? Are you rigging the results? Are you asking the wrong questions, setting up the wrong kind of parameters to test it? I mean, you can't just go out and say, well, look, I can see so far. And because, you know, one equals one plus one equals two, it's a flat earth. They've got nothing to do with one another. And, and they try and bring all these things in to make it make sense, and it doesn't. Now, all you've got to do is pick up a camera and study the night for a while, and you'll know that none of their debate can ever make any sense. It can't work into the natural workings of what you see going on. If I didn't have this on pause, and uh, in one of my next videos I'll probably use um, a night video as background, you can see how quickly these things move and everything moves in sync. And there are millions and millions of stars in the sky, you know, and it's all just a projection around a globe. So I'm sorry, even if I was to even buy into that small little explanation, um, how do you explain how we exist in the rest of the universe? Or isn't there a universe? Are we just in this dome? Well, if we're in this dome, how did the dome get in nothing? You know, all their concepts are just full of shit. And originally, Flat Earth was another one of those psyops things that was started off. Because when I first started looking into it a few years ago, when I thought... I thought we decided a couple hundred years ago that the earth wasn't flat and that we couldn't sail off the end of it. But no, some idiots come up with this idea. And it wasn't just flat earth, concave earth too. But the concave earth one was more involved around one person and they were setting it up as more a cult and a, a religious thing. He he would be more your, your David Koresh type, you know, that could set up a cult that everyone would end up killing themselves in or getting murdered before the, the man comes and gets them. But um, they're just a few of the things that I'm going to mention so far. I've, because there's a lot of things out, in, out there in the world. Where do you start with how, how, how much you know about the corruption in the world? I mean, there's the royal family. I mean, well... Let's just say that um, people like Alex Jones and David Icke are good for informing about a certain level of truth, but there's also a lot of misinformation and deliberate um, misinformation. Because, I mean, as much as what I like a lot of people, how they're out there controlling the alternative media narrative and pushing things that people should be considering... I do also know that they're controlled opposition. David Icke and Alex Jones and um, others that I'm not going to mention right now, but there's a whole list of them that I could go off with. They're all basically controlling the alternative media narrative. And from inside the movement, they can also advise on what's going on inside the movements, what's planned against the government or any other things like that. It's a mutually beneficial thing. When I first started watching Alex Jones, I mean, for a start, I didn't like his voice, but, you know, I put up with that to listen for a bit. And I watched his Bohemian Grove. And I wondered, right then when I watched that, how did he actually get in there and film that so much when they've got so much security? He says he got snuck in but how how exactly did he sneak in that would have more security than Fort Knox so even though I appreciated that he was revealing real information I understood what he was saying wasn't real about him and how he got there he was basically look we're going to have a put you in there we want this to get out we need people to start you know bringing out with these different things and creating all these different things and 
you know, you'll be the one bringing it out. You can control the narrative. There's no way he would have got in there unless someone let him in. No way. And you can <laughs> you can think he's all sneaky deaky and he, he could do it, but he's got a camera crew with him for crying out loud. You might be able to sneak in individually, but there was at least two people there because you could see him at times. So, and it wasn't just a mobile phone they were filming it on either, you know. Did they have mobile phones back then? Of course they did. It was, a, you could hear, poorly admittedly, because they were a fair way back, and it, I don't think they had a microphone, it was just the echo of the area, so it was hard to hear a lot of the ceremony, but um, again, what he was recording it with was not amateur, amateur stuff. So it didn't take very long to figure out that Alex Jones was controlled opposition. Um, PSYOPs. They introduce these things and then control the narrative. Your super soldiers are exactly the same. The, the, the new breed of super soldiers that have come out, they talk about, you know, all these things that go on, but then they've, they've got out of it, they've passed it, and someone will ask them a question and they'll go, Oh, I'm not allowed to say that. It's like, hang on. No one's controlling you. So why are you not allowed to say that? They're not allowed to talk about certain people or say certain things. That's because those super soldiers that have come out, and there's a few of them that, uh, and one with his black goo that's no longer living, there's a few of them that have come out. They say that they're out of the program. No, they're not. They're still in it. They're running the program that they were trained to do. Controlled opposition. Controlling the narrative. And I see one super soldier, pretty big on Gaia TV. He's flashed across a lot of YouTubes. It's actually really starting to annoy me that his fake face and his MK Ultra programming is out there conning people. But then I'm not going to say too much out about these people because it really is up to people to decide for themselves. And a lot of it does come down to intuition. Sometimes you do need to talk, uh, listen to other people talk, to hear them to see whether, well, you know what, that just didn't feel right with me. Or, on the other side is like, wow, I didn't think anybody else knew that or felt like that. I mean, it is something that we all need to be able to decide for ourselves. And taking away the controlled narrative side of the whole alternative media, and I mean, ugh, I'm even seeing it now that like there's this um, alternative community that's setting up uh, as a political party and I thought well let's check out this guy in New Zealand that's attached to the same MK Ultra operative that's infiltrated this community and see if he's going into the political arena too and oh my goodness Sure enough, he was. It's like, right, I'm getting it now. They're starting to, they've got a, a following behind them now. They've got all the support of the people and the alt media and everything. And now they're going to move forward into setting up their own political party and then try and get into the political system. And that is kind of scary if you think that, well, there's a reason I put up um, Yuri's thing on sub subversion. Our government is subverted, has been infiltrated. Our government, our education, all our institutions, our legal system, everything has been infiltrated and subverted. And now some of those alternative 
voices that have got a strong following leading the alternative narrative are now going to set up in planned opposition. Some they're going to use. I mean, the thing is that the people that are going into these political parties are MK ultra controlled. I have no doubt about that. They are setting up a very big scheme, it looks like, worldwide. And they're using the freedom movement and all this other coronavirus stuff. I don't know, did they did they plan it up? Oh, who's behind the MK Ultra anyway? Who's programming these people? Why are they even put in these places in the first place? For who? To do what? They're there, we know that. I know that. Well, I know that. Other people might think that they don't even exist, which is again another issue why I am doing this video to tell people of all the different conspiracy theories, I suppose, if you want to put them all under one, what was it, the CIA or the, that invented that term as a psyops term to detract from people trying to get the truth out there? Because what is a conspiracy? A conspiracy is when two or more come together to achieve the same outcome. So really, what is conspiracy theory is, theory is what someone is saying about what two or more people have come together to conspire to achieve together. Now you don't need to know what's going on behind the closed doors of any business to know that you know there's stuff going on behind closed doors that you don't see or know and they don't tell you and they won't tell you and they've got no intentions of telling you and what they do tell you is a controlled image of what they want you to see that's all an image it's not the truth So I don't want to stick too much on one subject. I just want to try and cover as many different things that I've looked into. Like, um, I got hacked a few years ago and been a little bit computer savvy. And at the time too, we only had fiber optics that was managing barely megabytes per minute. Someone hacked my computer and I was actually watching on the screen a download um, massive gigabytes per second and the only way I could stop it was to actually take the battery out of my laptop so I, I knew that I'd been pushing a few buttons somewhere I didn't know how though <laughs> I really didn't know how and um, but the strange thing was that because I was able to um, see what happened to my computer was actually supposed to, to wipe it and leave me completely without nothing on my computer but as I said I'm a little bit computer savvy so I was able to reboot my computer and screenshot all the images that were coming up of the virus that they put on behind this massive download to find out what it was. It was called an Abitian virus and uh, I started and it gave me a little bit of information to work with but not much so I pretty much got as much screenshots as what I could and then I removed the the virus and everything from my sis from my system and started to look into the details that I could find out about this virus now strangely enough um, I've been looking for it through all my file of stuff recently and I'm going to have to dig a bit deeper and to find out exactly where. But um, it also coincided with the time that Snowden had just come out too. And so it, it was in my mind that uh, I had heard something about um, Database Central <laughs> in Australia. So it wasn't one of those things that was in my mind at the time. but I'd heard about it. So when I looked at um, the IP address that I was able to follow through on certain things, I found an IP address and it came up with 
some address in the middle of nowhere right in the middle of Australia and it it um, it was near the border of um, Queensland uh, not Queensland Western Australia South Australia and Northern Territory it was um, it might have even been closer to the eastern side I don't can't quite remember but it was in the middle of nowhere and it was like seriously who would even have an, an IP address there but the thing was it ca it came back and said the IP address was a registered to a ditch witch and I didn't know what a ditch witch was and I went and looked that up and that's well kind of like well I think it was like a bulldozer or something like that and it's like so you expect to tell me that the IP address in the middle of Australia that hacked my computer and took all those gigabytes off came from a bulldozer in the middle of Australia no not buying that there was something going on there and what I believe is that this is why I've been trying to find it is that that location that said ditch witch was actually what Edward Snowden talked about that somewhere in the center of Australia there is communications central headquarters and that actually brought credence to it so whether it's true or not I don't know I'm just saying that uh, it's crossed my mind that it is highly likely I mean what are the chances of some guy in, in his bulldozer in the middle of Australia been able to download gigabytes when even your ordinary connection and how did he do it in the middle of Australia I mean you don't have coverage it's got to be satellite so and even satellite that wasn't even a very good speed back then because I'd had had satellite too so I knew that and I even when I um I went in and I saw the uh, computer geeks in town and I asked them a few questions and I said under what circumstance could you download gigabytes per second and he just looked at me like I was asking some crazy question and he said you can't I said well somebody can I said I was watching it I said somebody virtually downloaded my whole computer within you know less than a minute and he said I don't know of any technology any speed internet or anything like that that could actually do that and uh, if I had had the foresight to think at the time but I was if I hadn't acted quickly I wouldn't have been able to recover any of this on my computer because the only reason that the virus didn't finish running and getting everything off my computer before it implemented that virus was because I pulled the battery out and it, it couldn't it had no no electricity no brains to work it just shut straight down and there was nothing they could do about that so I couldn't actually I didn't have the time to pick up the camera and video the screen showing me this download or this upload it wasn't a download it was an upload out of my computer so fast at speeds at speeds you wouldn't even see pretty much today with your 5g it's still even hard to complete I mean per second gigabytes that's a lot that's a little bit about that then that led me to look more at Pine Gap and um, what I let what I was looking at with Pine Gap also join the um, over the the Jindalee over the horizon radar network and all the radar networks and also the fact that Pine Gap I don't know it's a lot like uh, when I was looking this feeling that I get when I'm in the land somewhere I just see underneath Australia from Pine Gap like they go to um, I think it's Port Hedland the um, American nukes to refuel because of the uranium that comes out of Pine Gap that's officially but the submarines that come in there too refuel there but 
they don't refuel at Port Hedland. They go underground all the way to Pine Gap. And I know this sounds crazy. This is an out there thing that I couldn't even prove to anyone. And from Pine Gap, it goes all the way down to near the border between uh, South Australia and Western Australia. There's a, actually a heat anomaly that came, that was uh, recorded there years ago in a Nexus magazine article, uh, hundreds of kilometres long. They had no idea why it was there. And I did. It was a straight line. It's an under, under the ground tunnel. Submarines actually come in at Port Hedland, go to Pine Gap, and pretty much head down to the bottom and come out. I know, it sounds weird. You'd think, wow, how could you have so many tunnels? That's a long way. Well, you know, they've got these, um, when they did Denver Airport, they were talking about these big diamond drills that they had that are pretty much um, liquefying uh, the rock in front of them. The process is, you know, not as quick as what you would imagine but they do it I mean and look at the um, Gothard tunnel that they built through um, uh, what, what was it the Alps um, I can't even remember the places now I can remember the weird ceremony but yeah the Gothard tunnel that's right underneath the bottom of a, of a mountain so if they can build it underneath a mountain they can certainly build it under the earth and it's there but it's more subterranean. I think they're taking advantage of the artesian basins, the water basins that already exist as large funnels underneath. I mean, a large part of Australia underneath is water. So all you'd need to do in a lot of circumstances is break through a little bit of resistance, let the water flow through and you've got a whole underwater canal system. So, you know, and besides, you have to consider that the people that want to achieve control of this world don't think in terms of, you know, if we can't get it done tomorrow, we're not going to do it at all. Some of the things they've got in mind are for the next generation. They're not even for this generation to see the fruits of. So they've got long vision when they do things and they will not always do them quickly. The more slowly they can do them, the less attention they draw to themselves and piece by piece they can change things without people ever noticing it's ever been changed. Until one day you wake up and you go, wow, how did we get to 2020 with COVID and the world locked down in this crazy situation? Like it just happened overnight. No, it didn't. Lots and lots of things, lots of people, lots of agendas going on. And also too that um, there's a large part of um, like when Alex Jones was finally shut down from YouTube and censored that only creates more of a validity for his voice but he had a big following before that happened the same with David Icke and pretty much the same with this Morgan guy not quite in the same scale as big as but getting there. I mean, he's an Aussie guy. But then again, he got big by going on to American radio, you know, going outside of Australia to get the audience because, well, Australia's never been a very big audience for having big thinkers and people that speak out. You know, we're more like, oh, yeah, she'll be right, mate. Yeah, she'll be right, mate. So as I said, I don't want to stick too much on one subject and I just, I'm going to take you all over the place with all different subjects to give you a broad view of all the different things that I've encountered and my perspective on them. So let's look at um, medications and uh, shootings and things like that. Port Arthur shooting. My mum was um, actually down at Port Arthur the day that that was happening. 
she's always played tennis and she's always going around the place playing playing tennis and she was down there that day over at New Bena. she was playing tennis and um, her and her husband my stepfather they were going to go to Port Arthur but they decided they'd just you know head on home lucky they did because um, mum just got out as the cops are shutting everything down and when I say out if you go into Port Arthur um, go down to Port Arthur and you stick, stay on the main highway um, you've got to turn off to go down into the Port Arthur area but if you just kept going you'd end up doing a completely big loop and coming back at Tirana so mum was at Nubina which was as part of that loop and she came out at Tirana and they were shutting off before Port Arthur. Now, thing is with a lot of these things that I gave up watching TV and the news a long time ago because you know what, I was so tired of the stories they were telling me and it, it's just depressing. I didn't want to look at the world through their eyes anymore so I started living my life. So a lot of these events I didn't actually have you know, like I did when I was a kid, you know, newspaper headlines to remind me and everything. All I had to go on was when I heard about it and I looked into it. So I knew about the Port Arthur one because I had talked to mum that night when she said it was all going on. And it hadn't really come out publicly then either what was going on. And that, that sort of really spun my mind out. I wasn't even in Tasmania at the time, I was in Queensland and I had just given birth to my first son so yeah it was a bit of a spin out to think that wow mum could have been one of those victims, I'm glad that they decided to go home and not down to the Broad Arrow Cafe and have uh, a little bite to eat down there amongst the ruins, I'm glad they chose differently that day. But when it comes to you know when it did come out and they said a guy from Copping first of all I thought Copping? A guy from Copping? Who comes from Copping? Nobody comes from Copping and then you look a bit more into it and you realise that um, he was heavily medicated with antidepressants and then I started looking into the antidepressant side of it and finding out how the uh, International Association which is all the the World Psychiatry so Associations get together and pull their information had and I've got a copy of the article somewhere in my files I don't even know if it's still online but the article from all these psychiatrists basically said that every single shooting was associated with side effects of these drugs that instead of having the effect of calming them down it had the opposite effect and it was the um, it's always listed as contraindications of any medication that you can take you know any antidepressant can have the opposite effect it can make you psychotic too and essentially if you are in a, a mentally unstable condition it can tip you over the edge rather than bring you back. But I also believe that Martin Bryant was an MK Ultra operative because as I said nobody comes from copping, I mean you drive past the turn off to copping, what is it, a farmhouse? <laughs> well there was the shop at copping you know but that was it and then years later they'd have their, um, oh, what they call it, that rave that they have out there, all the people go to, I don't know. But anyway, so when it came to the Port Arthur shooting, I never bought the story on that in the first place either. And like Lee Harvey Oswell, he was just someone that was put up as a scapegoat. There's even the, um, what was it called, Seascape, I think it was, from memory used to drive past that place all the time even the story of how he was associated with the people there 
I mean, when you live in an area and you know the area and then you hear a story, it's like, you know, sorry, not buying that. Because, I mean, I used to work at the Port Arthur pub overlooking those ruins. I, <laughs> I used to go down at night time after I'd finish work and sit there and chill out, you know. It, it's an area I know very well. I could walk in around it in the dark and not bump into anything. I know the area and the people too. I mean, it's not like the people are that hard to get to know either. Like any area, they've all got their own inner community, their own mindset, and the Bush Telegraph down there works better than a telephone, like it does in many places. We should remember that, you know, that the Bush Telegraph is something that was long in existence before computers existed. Now, because I live in a bubble to a certain degree because I don't watch the news and I don't really want to hear about all the massacres and everything, I don't want to know. You know so I didn't know that. I think I did hear a little bit something, someone talking about something that happened in Christchurch, but, you know, it's like, yeah, just more of the same. They're all just set up for some reason or another or they're fake, you know, one way or another. Like 9-11, 9-11 again, an inside job. I mean, for years you used to have, um, like, uh, all the terrorist bombings that started in Ireland. And uh, it had taken months to find out who was behind it. And this is in a smaller community. But the day that it happened, they're televising before the second towers even hit that it's, you know it's one particular person they're responsible and they know exactly who did it and it's like nah this smelled of a, of a setup right from the word go and then watching the buildings free fall and and watching the plane just go into the side of the building and disappear no plane does that ah uh, there's just 9-11 was again something involved too that solved a lot of problems and did a lot of things that were on the elite agenda to achieve. Like, uh, even the gold that disappeared, that the Chinese, after the Second World War, had given up a, a fair amount of their gold as a security because um, there was anti-Asian sentiment because of the Japanese involvement in the war and to help you know, people become confident that the Chinese were no threat. They gave up um, millions and millions of dollars back then of um, gold bars as security. And they were issued US bonds for them. Now, the Chinese had come to ask for that back and America said no. So, to seek remedy, they went to the international court. And the International Court ruled that America has to give the gold back, that they have to honour those bonds and give the gold back. And the court ordered that on a particular date that that had to occur. Now, I'm not sure from memory now whether it was the day before or the, the day of 9-11. But uh, they were on a deadline and they weren't going to meet it. And suddenly the building that housed apparently all that gold collapsed and it was all destroyed and the Chinese couldn't get it back. Okay, so the building collapsed, you dig it back up and you dig out the gold bars. Yeah. Not fishy at all, is it? 9-11 covered a lot of things, did a lot of things, achieved a lot of things. Like the WMDs, the weapons of mass destruction, that were never found. Well, we all knew he was never going to find any. And even though the international community were not behind him, Bush went in there. Because that was all part of the agenda. All part of the plan. And as I said, I don't watch the news too much and keep up with things. So 
after 9-11, you know, and seeing Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden's face all the time, that seemed to just change in every news article. It was a different picture. And it's like, what do they think that all Arabs look the same? It's like, yeah, okay. They're not. <laughs> he changed all the time, the picture of Osama bin Laden. But he had this general same look about him. Anyway, um, years later, um, I hear about this guy that's running America. His name's Obama. And it's like Obama, who, what? So I look at, um, see even now I have trouble separating the names. You know, the guy that became president of America? I don't see any difference between him and Osama bin Laden. Shit, what's his name? I can't even think of it. Because to me, they are like the same people. And all the uh, things that, Trump actually brought out about him before um, he, you know, even looked at running for office. But then I said it long before he even said he was going to run for office when he was doing Celebrity Apprentice. I kept saying to people, you know what, I wouldn't be surprised if he ran for president one day because it's like he's trying to sift through Hollywood and all the well-known personalities to see who, who he can trust and what kind of moral fibre they are and put them under the under a bit of pressure to see how they perform. It was like he was selecting allies because he had no reason to put, to do this celebrity apprentice. Yeah. And it was, why was he doing it? And watching him, you know, in the boardroom at the end of the day when he would, you know, they're all calling him Mr. Trump. There's this level of he's already the president type thing, you know, and here are the underlings talking to him. So, yeah. Before he even announced his presidency, he had well and truly tested the, uh, the, the movers and shakers of the world, you know, the entertainers, the, the actors, the singers, and he's tested their moral fibre under the guise of Celebrity Apprentice. So when he did announce for presidency, he already had a bevy of supporters that had influence that he knew he could rely on. And he also knew that they knew there was going to be a lot of discretion that was going to be required if the swamp was going to be attacked and brought down. And yeah, I loved it when he called it the swamp because that pretty much brings it down to, you know, America's got its swamp, we've got our swamp, every country's got their own swamp. And we need to realise that it is, it's not just in America, it's everywhere. It's a global new world order. Bush Senior first started talking about it in the 80s. And whilst there's only one speech of him saying it. I was around in the 80s I do, and I was still watching TV and the news then. I remember him all the time talking about and this new world order. You know, we're going to march out there and we're going to save the world. It's like, oh, piss off. You're going to ruin the world. And that's what they've done ever since. War after war after invasion. You know, some country didn't give them what they want. So, you know, Oh, they're going to find some reason to go in there and put in their military and control the situation to make sure that they get what they want the way they want it. And even though Trump's not playing the same game as them, he's still to a certain degree. He's put trade embargoes on people because and sanctions because they're trading with other people that he doesn't want them to trade with. What happened to free trade? So, yeah, he's a little bit capitalistic, Trump. He's going to be in on the businessman. Ah, oh, my cat's meowing. I'm going to have to go for a sec. So I forgot what I was talking about, so I'll just... Um, the moon landing. What do I think about the moon landing? Well, I know that as a kid I was really excited with the prospect that, um, you know, that we'd actually gone to the moon. But then when I got to be a little bit older, long before people you know, the internet and people came out with this, we didn't land on the moon. 
I actually wondered how could we land on the moon? I mean, I had watched the televised thing. I'd seen the astronauts in their suits get into the rocket and I'd watched all that promo and everything. And the biggest issue I had was with their space suits. I mean, uh, you know, you look at a picture of the Earth and it's got the, the Van Allen radiation belt around it and all our satellites exist within that Van Allen radiation belt because they can't get out past it. It's lots of radiation. And even though they like to say that space is a vacuum, it's not a vacuum. It's moving, it's, it's fluid, it's like, it's like water, except it's not water. But it moves much like a river would move. It's constantly flowing. And hence why they talk about solar winds. Now you can go on to many different sites where they've got the, the live feed, the real-time information of the solar winds, the protons, electrons and all these other components that are in the solar wind and the speed they are travelling at. Now all these particles are called radiation. So you look at, um, you watch some movies where, you know, it's dramatic that, oh no, a solar storm or radiation storm is coming, they need to get out because they're going to get bombarded and, and these minute particles will pierce through them and destroy them completely, you know, that their suit won't stop it. They're that minute that our technology, what we're wearing, is not going to protect us from something so quantum and small. So essentially it can penetrate and kill us. And if you're going to get bombarded, you're just going to die. So we've seen movies where that's happened, you know, where people have been bombarded by these particles and it's just killed them because they're not shielded from it behind something. Well, what they could shield behind, I don't know, but that was my whole thing for it. First of all, you needed a certain amount of velocity, escape velocity I don't think that the rockets even had the capacity to get past the d the two Van Allen belts, which uh, a few years ago there was a rare occurrence that they observed a third um, belt that occurred for a couple of weeks around the Earth. So the Earth is highly, round the outside, is very full of radioactive stuff. So let's say, for example, that you did actually manage to get out past the Van Allen radiation belt and you're just in the solar wind. Now there's no atmosphere on the top of the moon which means that basically the solar wind is going to be moving particles. There would be no loose particles on the surface of the earth because it is moving. It is not static. It is not in a vacuum. It's not a bubble. You know, there's got to be some the only thing that stops us from being destroyed is that we've got an atmosphere and things can stay in place within that atmosphere. The moon doesn't have that atmosphere so nothing can stay in place. So the winds would come along and get rid of it. But there's no wind on the moon according to them. You know, it, it's just like a, a breathless, still, calm day. But what happened to that solar wind? It's not getting stopped by an atmosphere. That solar wind is going straight across the surface of the moon and hitting that supposed astronaut who's got on what I would consider to be no better than glad wrap. How is that going to protect him from quantum microscopic particles that are traveling so fast that it's going to be virtually like he doesn't even exist you know, it's going to go through him so fast, he's just going to end up dead. The radiation would kill him within probably seconds, if not minutes. So that's my biggest issue. And when it did come out that um, people are saying, oh, look, all the footage is fake, and, and I started looking at all the different things and everything, and... Uh, I tend to agree with a lot of the analysis.
that I've seen of people dying. That, um, all right, so I've talked about that there's no wind on the moon and there should be because there's shadows. There's shadows from the sun, you know, so if there's shadows from the sun and light takes time to travel and move, move. Yes, light moves, and it's the movement of that light, that energy out, that creates the solar wind. And in that solar wind are particles. And every time there's a, a corona mass ejection, there's a whole abundance of particles that can be shot out at rapid speeds that would just obliterate anything not protected within an atmosphere. So, to a certain degree, they tell us that there's no atmosphere on the moon. But there has to be, to a certain degree, an atmosphere there that doesn't completely erode it away to nothing. Because if, if there was nothing protecting the moon from the solar winds, it would have been eroded away by now. It, it just... It's like... Um, you know, a piece of piece of chalk in water that if you ran it down a stream, sooner or later getting bashed over all those rocks and and you know, dissolved in the water that it's it's gonna disappear and not exist anymore. So, you know, if if that was the case that it had no atmosphere, then ultimately for how old they say the moon is we would actually see a much, 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 much smaller moon that used to be so much bigger to eventually it will get worn down to nothing and we can't see it. And what will happen then? Because apparently the moon is pivotal to creating the tides on the earth and keeping that flow going. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that and a lot of these questions came up because I did go out there night after night for several years and just study the night sky. Now, did I see anything unusual in the night sky? Uh, yes, but uh, when I first noticed something in the sky and why I really started to do it, um, it was because of a really large darkened area. There were no stars. There should have been stars. I'm living in the middle of the country and I see stars all around all the time. I know where they're supposed to be and where they're not. And why is this one area just, it's almost like it's blotted out. And I hadn't even bought my camera then. I had, uh, I went and bought a telescope. And I looked through the telescope, and the first thing I looked at was um, uh, it was um, uh, Scorpius. Can't even think of the name of the st stars now. But anyway, they were coming down, and I just zoomed in to watch one of them to look through the telescope. <laughs> and all these other things were flying around in the view of it. It's. Um, something was moving out there in space in front of um, the planet I was looking at or the, the star I was looking at. It's not to say that it was at that, that particular star, it's just that in that direction of space there was something moving around in the area be there between that star and me that I could see. And it was like, wow. And they were moving, like um, not like insects would, because I did do photographs of insects and studied them, got photographs of them, videos of them, did all these different things to see if it could have been them that I actually saw moving, and it's not. The directions are very deliberate and they are very mechanical. So, um, no, not insects, not animal something out there and was flying around and because I saw that I wanted to um, photograph it so that's where I went and got the camera I spent quite a bit of money on the camera because I wanted something that was good enough and I got a tripod as well because um, 
I just can't stand still so holding a camera still to try and video something is next to impossible for me so um, yeah I, I would make these observations for myself now when I went to the camera the observations became different you can't see them in the same way as the telescope so I made observations that way and then I went and got another camera and a little mount thing to try and stick on the telescope and record it in the end I gave up because you know I couldn't get the camera to see what I was seeing but I was glad that I got the other camera the good the, the bigger one because um, it has an infrared beam on it so as you take a picture it shoots out the infrared beam and it will actually pick up things that your visual eye can't see so the camera is going to bring back a larger light spectrum than the visual spectrum that you can see and when it translates that into an image it will translate it into a particular color or whatever so I learned a lot from doing this I learned about redshift and blue shift I learned about the Rayleigh scattering why was the moon turning orange just before it would go down or as it was coming up and uh, it's due to the Rayleigh scattering because as it comes to a certain angle and the light is refracted in a certain way it splits the light spectrum towards the red and the moon becomes orange and that effect is known as the Rayleigh scattering so I actually discovered these principles from my, for myself just by observation and went looking for the scientific term I'm very much a person that likes to find things out for myself. Some things are easy to find out for yourself and like with some of the lessons I've learnt in life too that even despite my best advice to myself it's something I've got to experience for myself. So that's why I suppose I could say that Life's been a pretty big roller coaster up and down, a lot of challenges. And you do open your eyes up to a lot of the different things that go on in the world. I mean, I've always lived life, been a very trusting person. I take people as they are. I don't have any reason to mistrust people until they give me a reason to. But, you know, as you get older and wiser, you keep putting yourself out in those positions. I mean, the amount of times I've been used, and I refused to stop putting myself out there for people because I wasn't going to let those that would abuse that from me, you know, put off those, what I could do for others that don't do that. I mean, you know, so you help the wrong people. It doesn't mean that the right people you know that you should not be who you are I wasn't going to let them destroy me because they took advantage of my kindness and my charity I mean I have been used in <laughs> so many times my kids are kind of you know well they got pretty pissed off with me because you know I keep giving to people and all we do is end up getting used and kicked out and it's like you know when are you going to smarten up mum it's like well it's yeah it is one of those things is when do you smarten up but it you see if I do smarten up I lose that part of myself that is is human and and trusts and believes in other people and in the goodness of other people I want to believe that people are good and honest and that um, even the ones that aren't you know it's, they just perhaps need someone to put them in the right direction you know a lot of the um, reform stories you hear of reformed from whether it's crimes or drugs or alcohol or some kind of addiction or whatever you know there's a certain amount of of soul reflection and responsibility taken for their actions and understanding that what we do in life can always change 
from the second we decide to change it. We don't have to keep going down these same roads. Kids and animals. Should get a lock on my door. It would make it a lot easier. Anyway, I forgot what I was talking about. Got interrupted, sorry. Um, I was thinking, though, that I didn't say about the Christchurch shooting. I'm not sure how much I can actually say about that without getting pulled down, but um, the uh, I watched the video all the way through before I pretty much listened to other people do their own walkthrough and what they thought of it because I wanted to see what I saw first. And one of the things that I noticed was that um, there was someone else in the car with him. And I'm talking about it now from the perspective of I've discovered my own things and then I've watched others. And what I haven't heard that anyone else talk about is that there was someone else in the car with him. The stage where he pulled over and just sat there, someone else um, behind the camera that was filming at that stage, he said he, the sound went off. And you, you couldn't hear what he said, but you could quite easily read his lips. Um, I think it was, uh, what are you doing? Or something to, the, to that effect. So he was asking the other person in the car, what was, you know, what are you doing? And he turned the sound off so you couldn't hear him saying that, but you could see him saying it because the camera had turned round onto him. And it wasn't the head cam that he was using. Or, I don't know, maybe it was the head cam he took off and he's mouthing to the people that are watching it, what are you doing? He's waiting for the signal. So it's clear, I don't know, but he's, he's clearly in communication. But then later on too, after it's all happened, he's driving down the road. And if you listen very carefully, there is someone that says something very quietly to him in the car that actually provokes him to say certain things that he says. Now, whether he whispered that little voice, you know, and pretended it was somebody else and then responded to that, it could have been, I don't know. But it leads me to believe that there was somebody else in the car. And then when you get there, and he's got out of the car and he's heading into the um, place. The first thing besides how <laughs> how much it looked like a, a boy trying to play soldier um, was the car on the left with the back door open. It was like who would leave their back door open like that? I even wound it back a few times to see if there was anyone sitting in the car. There was no one sitting in the car. The back door's open. Why was the back door of the, the car open? It was the first car that you can see as he comes to turn into it. Now, I've heard other people say that the, um, the silver car that was parked right outside the front, um, you know, was pretty much his car or was involved in it and that they were flagged through by police later on. But the thing is that um, in looking at that video, that silver car actually disappeared about, I think it was about 10 minutes in, when he went out to reload. There was a guy in the other room that ran to the side that he never bothered about. And I think that once the guy had left, that was his car. He jumped in it and he took off because when he came back the second time, he came in the other entrance and walked around to the, the other driveway entrance to walk to go into the mosque and the silver car was gone. So there was no silver car there to the end. It was gone by the second time he'd gone in there. Now, whether it was a planned event or a, 
I don't know. I mean, really, I don't, I, I don't know what to think of the offender. Everything's wrong about it. I mean, like, why, why was he... Um, you hear when he comes out of the car, um, he goes back for more ammo and he comes out the second time to go down. He goes to the second gate. And that's when I start to notice this, that um, every time he takes a shot, the um, music stops. And when the shots stop, the music comes back in. And it's like, what kind of a thing has he got going where you can only hear the shots you know why you can hear the music but he's it it mute it how is it connected to the gun so that every time he takes a shot it blocks out the music so that you can hear him taking the shot that was kind of curious to me i didn't know how that worked how could he record split second timing like that you know from going I'm listening to the music, now I'm shooting, and it goes to the bang, 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 and then as soon as it stops, it's going back to the music, and then bang, 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 and it's it's back and forth between the music. It's like, how is the music attached to the shooting, to the gun, to the sound? So maybe it is a recording. Who knows? Maybe he was just doing it in time. I don't know. Did people die? <laughs> Look, unless I see something happen right in front of my eyes, I I don't even know that half the wars have gone on that have gone on because they've only ever gone on on TV and in the newspaper. And the people that you do hear the stories out of on TV, it's, well, are they just yet again another actor, crisis actor or something like that? The only things I'm going to believe are the things I see and the real people I meet that have had real experiences. They're the only people I'm going to believe. Other than that, everything else is up for interpretation. The whole thing about it didn't seem right. I know that um, there are a lot out there that said it was all CGI and fake. Um, I don't think it is all CGI and fake. I think there is elements of real in there. How real it was, whether there were crisis actors and no real victims. I, you know, are we ever going to know for sure? No, we're not. Because they make these things so real. And that's maybe a little bit of the problem that I have that maybe thinking this is more inclined to be more like with Port Arthur and MK Ultra Operative that has gone in and committed real crimes and done real things because in most of the cases that you see the responses of people coming out of it, it, it it's dramatised and there's blood and there's crying and there's but I haven't seen that maybe it was on at the time and I didn't see it because I didn't watch the TV and get all the news videos of all the drama and everything but um, I'm not seeing the same kind of thing. Much like with Port Arthur, people really died there. But it didn't mean that it was any less of a fake incident. Fake in the, the fact of what they said it was. Not that it happened, but why it happened. I mean, it was a planned event. It was always going to happen. Just never thought that they'd pick Port Arthur, but hey... Who knew they were going to do this this year too? Exactly this thing. So there, there's lots of different things out there that, you know, um, like with the Denver airport, when that came out with all its weird murals and its all, you know, its Illuminati everything. And I mean, that was just like advertising, you know, what we're starting with our shit full on now. But I also know, like, um, I have to take, a, as I say, a lot of the people that come out as whistleblowers are just more, again, controlled narratives. Because when it comes to, like, Freemasonry, I know that it's a club. And um, my grandfather, um, on my mum's side, came from the Isle of Man. And 
Oh, yeah, I know there's, like my Uncle Jack, his, his brother, he was also a free, we'll say also a Freemason. Pop never advertised that he was a Freemason, but their father um, was a man from the Isle of Man, and he was a rather, I don't know, influential sort of movie shaker, you know, traveller, businessman, fairly wealthy. And because he did all those things, he didn't marry till late in life. And, you know, he only had two kids, which was my pop and my Uncle Jack. Now, Uncle Jack and Auntie Kath, I mean, seriously, you couldn't get two more blessed souls on the planet that would give you the shirt off their back to help you. And Uncle Jack is a Freemason. He would always um, go to the regular meetings and he was always involved in community af affairs, church affairs and helping, you know, anywhere he could help, he was there to help. And so from knowing that about the Freemasonry, before I'd even discovered the Illuminati, I understood the level uh, of knowledge uh, in a club. Like I understood that Uncle Jack was just a member of the club and it was kind of one of those things that even, well mum was the one that told me all about this. Uncle Jack never told me as much in as many words. It was always mum and when mum was telling me she, you know, it was like Shh, I'm telling you a secret because, you know, th even she knew that there was something going on more behind the Freemasons than what Uncle Jack was letting on on the surface. So to find out that even Mum, I mean, if she was alive today, some of the things, well, <laughs> she wouldn't have believed half of the things that I've even talked about here. She would completely disagree with me. But yet I also think that because of Uncle Jack and Pop's connection and also the fact that Mum did have experiences in, in her own life. She never got too much into them. She never wanted to say too much about them because she came from a different generation where, you know what, you shut up about it and never spoke about it again. It was just that way. So um, I couldn't find out too much about what had gone on but there is some kind of an association on my mum's side with that and I think that's why well I did the video yesterday about how I had something cut out of my neck when I was 10 I didn't actually say it but and I didn't know until I heard about RFID chips a few years ago that and they were talking about sticking it in people's necks and the, how they'd had surgeons remove them. And it was like, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> and then I, the first thing you think of is, well, that's what it was. And then you think, oh, but why would they want to stick one in me? Why me? Well, I do know that um, there are some things that I utilize more of than other human beings in this planet that maybe that's why me but it brings into mind a lot of things too and this is there's a connection with my dad being in the military I've talked about the Canungra um, military base well my dad had gone there he'd gone there for training and and things like that and but what I hadn't said too is also about why I believe that I don't actually have very many memories of my father is because where it, whenever he used to take me anywhere my memories were pretty much wiped of it. I've got a few memories of where he took me to the pub and sat me on a stool and gave me a raspberry. Now shouldn't I have a few more than that? I remember the day he left home too. We went plenty of places that, you know, that there were times when Dad 
would come home and try and make up because mum was really pissed off with him. So, you know, he'd do this binge thing and we'd go plenty of places. But I've got no memory. There's no memory of it. None of my dad. And it's, it's just like someone has wiped it out. And I even got to the stage where I wondered, wow, did dad take me somewhere and let something happen to me and they wipe my memory? Then I started to think about my dad's sister, Auntie Anne, who was in charge in New Norfolk when this was all going on. She was the head nurse of the mental ward. I mean, these things started to come together in my head. Did Dad take me up to Auntie Anne and they do something to me? Is this why I've always not liked her? You know, is there a reason that I have saw, thought different things is because you've done something to me and so I don't remember it and dob on you, you wipe out my memory. So it, it takes away that memory of actually going with you somewhere in the first place. I don't know. It's just one of those things that I never will know. And really, whether it did happen or not, Clearly, if they did do something to me, it was taken out when I was 10 years of age. And that would have explained the reaction too, because I've heard that if it's not removed carefully, it's connected into nerves and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised what happened happened. So I'm gonna go a little bit off track and I'm gonna go into history just a little bit here because um, I'm the kind of person, as I said, that I don't like to take other people's opinions. I like to find things out for myself. So when someone says that, you know, hieroglyphs mean something and they come out with this story, it's like, well, <laughs> I want to know for myself. So months and months and months and months later, after going through and learning the hieroglyphs and getting an understanding of them, I come up with my own translation. And before that I did that with uh, the Enuma Elish and the, the cuneiform as well. I have done some uh, language studies. On language has got a, a, a power unto itself. Numbers too, there is a thing with numbers that I've got, I don't know why, that I see numbers in a particular way. In fact, if, if you were going to describe the universe in any way, the universal language actually isn't love, it's numbers. Because numbers, the, the one to nine numbers, represent the continuing exponential, fractal potential of creation to continually build upon itself out of zero, nothing. See, zero isn't a number. And uh, years, well, when was it? Back in 2012, I came across a book by Len Horowitz where he promised to explain how he discovered the solfeggio frequencies, the sacred solfeggio frequencies. So I read his book and I got to the last page and I thought, you salesman ripoff! What a fraud! Promising and even adding little bits through the way. Oh yes, I'll get to it. I'll tell you. He didn't mention one single thing about the sacred frequencies and how he came up with them. All it was was a book about his trip to somewhere. That was it. And I thought, oh bugger! Looks like I'm going to have to do it for myself. I'm going to have to find out for myself. So I did. I went and I got the hymn. And I thought, what do I do? And I just followed my nose on translating the notes in the numbers. And I also took the, the verses of the hymn and uh, also discovered the... Um, using the Latin to get the then basic 
cuneiform and hieroglyphic enunciation that it had come from in the first place because all language comes from somewhere and it's got a particular meaning and purpose behind each sound. So once I'd done all that and months and months and months and months later I had um, come up with not nine but 81 numbers. Yes it included the nine sacred solfeggio frequencies that Len came up with that I don't think he came up with at all that someone handed him a list and said here promote this yes more controlled opposition unfortunately and why if he had done what I had done and the only reason that I could actually come up with that conclusion is if I completely ignored what I had been taught about counting and not count any number that had zero in it. Because in my head, zero doesn't represent anything. It represents um, that you've got to nine, and 10 is the number that said it's all complete. From one to nine, it's all complete now. Now you've got that set at that one stage, and it's ready to go on to the next. It's not adding any more to nine, or the, the one to nine, it's more like saying they're all together and ready to go on the next level. It's announcing that the first level is f completed and the zero is ready to create out in the next level of numbers. I know it's a weird thing that you'd have to understand what's inside my head to be able to understand how I actually translated it. Because if I didn't even start off with this way of doing it, um, I wouldn't have come up with the numbers. I didn't didn't um, set out with any parameters other than to just write, I'm going to do this and see what I come up with. And what I came up with was not only 81 numbers, which was nine uh, scales, if you want to look at it, of s sacred frequencies, but also I was able to determine that there is its... Um, polar opposite frequency as well which is actually only one degree less than the actual frequency itself and the, and the actual explanation that I came up with in the translation side of the, the words um, I didn't intend for them to tell a whole story either I took each particular part and I translated it into something and then I wrote that particular word and what it meant and I then added it all together and then I read it to see if it made any sense and it was like wow that does not happen by accident that you can I was actually in awe not only of the mathematical precision that this piece of music had represented but how I'd actually uncovered it and came to that conclusion I mean how why it was just, yeah, it was one of those things that I got focused on and I did. And it took months of work to do it because uh, I had to go through and translate each note into a number representation. And for some reason, I had to do it three times uh, to, to ensure it's a whole process and explanation that seriously, I even though I created notes for myself as I went along and I read them back now, I still don't understand. I mean, if you talk about people channeling, I mean, I look at channelers out there and there are some legitimate channelers, I believe, but I think we all channel in our own way. And I think that a lot of these translations that I've done, whether they come from hieroglyphs or music, um, when I get into them I'm in another place I am accessing a higher part of my knowledge when I'm doing this research and interpretation and I kind of understand that which is why I actually have written myself so many notes over the years as I'm going through explaining to myself so that I can read it back, back later why I'm doing it and what I'm thinking of why I'm doing it but even though I do explain it to myself and I read back and I think well you didn't explain that really at all did you I wished I had so I've had the opportunity to 
look back at a lot of the things and be able to reflect on them and see how my perspective of them has changed over the years, if they have changed. So I can't really think of any other things that are in my mind right now to share with people about, you know, if you wanted to know what I thought on something that, you know, because if you don't like something that I say and you don't want to listen to me anymore, well, that's fair enough. I do exactly the same thing with other people too. <laughs> you know what, when you've heard the same thing over and over, you don't need to hear it again. And sometimes hearing it from other people said a different way, things can connect better. So, you know, I just put this stuff out there. People can take from it what they want. I'm not asking anyone to believe anything that I say. I certainly hope you've got your own opinions. And I just love it when people say, well, yeah, I agree with this, but it is those buts that when you can sit down and have a conversation with someone, that's when you really learn more. Because in those challenging of those buts, you get going and thinking, well, I didn't think of it that way before, but now that you've said that, that's got me thinking. So I love the buts. You know, I love people that actually say, well, I agree with you on that point but you know I didn't experience that so I don't have the same perspective have, have you looked at it this way and it's like well no I haven't actually thanks for telling me I'll just say goodbye <laughs> catch you next